Okay, so I'm here with head coach of New Era Lorgan, uh, Clan Wars double champ, um, and a professional MMA fight with four and two record there at home. And, uh, thank you very much for your time. How are you today? How's things? I'm good. Uh, yeah. Obviously, you're here now, you're a coach. We're going to build up to that, but you got into MMA a long time ago uh, to get to where you are. Uh, what brought you into MMA and why? And what was your first gym? So, basically, whenever I was younger, about eight or nine, I always loved boxing. I competed in boxing. So that went on until I was about 14, 15. And then around that age, I just started uh, misbehaving. I got into drinking and drugs and just sort of went off the rails from when I was about 15 till early 20s. So I just got myself in really bad shape. Uh, eventually, I found my way back into uh, full contact kickboxing just as a way of losing weight and getting fit again. I was there for a while, I was training there and I ended up competing in it. So I competed there for about two years, done well. And then I found out that I was going to have a child. But at this time I was still involved with drugs and drink and I was just partying every weekend. I, wasn't, I was in and out of trouble all the time. I was always in court. But when I found out that I was going to be a dad, I just thought, like, fuck, I have to wise myself up. So, shortly after that, I went and I got a job. I went and got, a, like, a real job. I started scaffolding. And eventually, I ended up working on a building site with a guy, Michael Doyle, who was a professional MMA fighter in the, in the area. And he just opened up this gym here. So it was just a brand new that had no members and was only... It was only getting off the ground then. So I didn't really know anything about MMA, but at the same time, McGregor had come on the scene. So it was all eyes on the UFC around that time. So it was like, I'll have a go at that. So I started training with Mickey, and then I just had a choice where I can keep doing what I'm doing and go nowhere with the kickboxing. There wasn't much eyes on, on the sport at that time. And I couldn't really see myself going anywhere with it. Yeah, so it was keeping me fit. And it was, I was getting a, an odd fight here and there. And there was maybe a couple of people coming to watch me, but it wasn't, there was no hype around it the way the MMA scene was. So I decided to go for MMA and just, that was it really. I had my first amateur fight. And then within a year of that, I lifted my first amateur title. Um, there was just no going back from there. Yeah, no, and that's good. Obviously, you'd, you'd said obviously you were involved in drink and, and drugs. Just for young people at home, how easy is it to go down that path and how fruitless is it to go down that path? Because there's no real good way out of it. Obviously, you've come out, you MMA has changed your life, saved your life to a sense. But like, just if you're going to give advice to younger people, like, what would it be? Because it's, it is quite easy to come across I would presume it was the same in Lorgan here as well, yeah? It was very easy to fall into that road. And it's just like, what I noticed mainly was coming from primary school and then going into secondary school, it was just a whole different world. In the secondary school, and then you had all the older kids who were drinking and smoking weed on break time. And it was just a lot of peer pressure and stuff. And then you, just, you sort of wanted to fit in. And then before you know it, you're just, you're fully into it. And, uh, Whereas then you start smoking weed and then you, you don't have ways to pay for the weed so you start end up, you're, you're selling it just to get your own and then that progresses and then it's just, it's just like a snowball effect and then before you know it you're that far into it, you don't know what, <laughs> what, what you're doing. Yeah, you get so far into it. I've, I've heard of people and I know people saying, they say, well I'll sell mine, to, yeah. I'll sell it to get mine. But then that creates, like I said, a snowball effect where all of a sudden I've known people myself where people have turned up at the door looking for 10 grand. Yeah. So that sort of way, and it's, it's, it's not a nice way to live. But obviously, um, throughout all that, were you ever scared during that, that, that part? Like, was it, was it ever dangerous? Or was it ever... There was a few times where, the, uh, like, I left home when I was 15 because I had younger siblings and the lifestyle I was leaving, I just I was bringing too much trouble around the door, so I was end up... I was living in houses with other guys around the same age as me that were doing the same thing as me and there's nights where like we're putting scaffolding poles up the door to make sure the door doesn't get put in through the middle of the night and you're sleeping with machetes under your pillows and you know, you're just always worried about 
sometimes you're not even sleeping, you're just sitting up all night and then sleeping during the day because you feel safer to sleep during the day. But there is some scary times and sometimes you owe people money. Do you know what I mean? It's just there's a lot of pressure on it too. Yes, yeah, it's, it's not like obviously you see in the movies and you see people going around in their fancy cars. It's not no, the glamour. No, like the top uh, 10 or 5% have nice cars and yeah, the they, spoils of it all. They're usually in business suits yeah. and they're usually, in, like I said, top class cars. And then uh, all throughout the middle, it's just it's not really what people assume it to be. And uh, the life isn't obviously fulfilling. But you made that change then to, to MMA. And like I said, MMA had more eyes on it. Um, when you look at it, we'll actually go into how it's evolved, but what was it like? Obviously, you competed at kickboxing, but you said, what was your first amateur fight kind of like? What was it like? Was there any nerves? Or did it feel different than kickboxing? Like, what was your expectations versus the reality? It felt, I was nervous, but at the same time, I was just, I, I really wanted to do it. I was so excited. That's what I wanted to do. It. I knew well before then what was involved because I was training kickboxing and then I came to an MMA gym I thought I could fight, but I was, I was all right on my feet, but I was getting took down, I was getting submitted, and I was like, this, like, this is real, real fighting. It was as close as you're going to get there. Real fighting, I found out it wasn't as hard as what I thought it was. <laughs> so it was just, I just kept coming back, and I got, got interested in the sport, and there was, there was always nerves, but I was excited, I, I wanted to do it, and I knew I was, there was more eyes on, on it, and it was just, I was just a far better buzz, if, if you get me. Yeah, because I've been to the likes of kickboxing shows or whatever, and you go there and there might be 50 people in the room, yeah. you know, the sort of way, and it might be a couple from your family, a couple for the other, the opponent's family. And whereas MMA, especially nowadays, even the reason shows, it's an event, it's an event sort of a thing. It's not like just going out and fighting, you've got the crowd, you've so much more to deal with. Um, how long was it before, like you said, within a year, you won your first amateur title? Talk to us about that experience, getting to the amateur title, like, was, did it feel any different leading up to it? Did it feel more important? It was, uh, I told you, I was, I'd started working on the building site with my, my first amateur coach, Mickey, and he would have been talking me into trying MMA, and I was giving it, like, I was hemming and hawing, and then when I did start doing it, and I had my first amateur fight, I think we were out celebrating after, and he pulled me to the side, and he said, listen, drop all the other shit you're doing, Go in with me a hundred percent on this, and I guarantee you this time next year you'll be a champion. And um, for me, like I didn't have much opportunities growing up. Nobody's ever like put much belief in me. And um, for somebody to come at his level, like he was former Clan Wars lightweight champion, he there's he had for four or five professional titles at the time. And um, for someone like him to say that he believed in me that I could do that, it was like fuck, I've got a shot here. I can do this, and I did. I just I went all in then. And that's uh, just, I was, I was an amateur, but to be honest, like I've been training like a professional my whole amateur career. So I have. Yeah, because especially, I want to say, it was around 2015 you made your debut in yeah. amateur, wasn't it? The rule sets would have been different then yeah, as well, wasn't it? Yeah, we were allowed knees to the head. Well, my first couple of amateur fights, we were allowed knees to the, to the head. So we were. Yeah, whereas that's not even a thing now. Yeah, because it, it was always just like, if somebody was shooting in, you, th you were throwing the knee. Now you, now you can't teach that? No, now you can't <laughs> teach that. And that's, I'll actually get on to that because you've, you've transitioned into coaching. But you touched on, obviously, do you think that's what younger people need is kind of someone that done something to you is to kind of throw their arm around them and show, show them that they can do something? Do you think that could be an issue? Possibly, yeah. Well, for me, like growing up, I was always looking up to guys who were, what for a better word, gangsters. Like. So and then when somebody positive comes in and... Like sort of takes you under the wing, gives you a different a different view on life and your possibilities and your opportunities that you can that you can you can do something with yourself. Yeah, no, and it is good like that when someone comes in and they say, "I believe in you, you can do something." It gives you a feeling like that you can't get through any drug, through any drink, you know that sort of a way. Um, that is just like it's a f fulfilling sort of thing that it's someone like actually like something that you you have to work for it, like the delayed gratification. It's called. Yeah, you have to put work in, like sacrifice something that you enjoy doing now for something that's going to be 10 times better because you earned it and you worked hard for it. Yeah, because especially nowadays when you look at like the social media platforms, TikToks, people don't have a memory or a span of five, five or six seconds to, to yeah. stay on a reel, whereas people want instant gratification, whereas what does it feel like to have that delayed gratification? I'd say that's a feeling like no other. It is, because you feel like you've earned it a lot more. 
Like you've put the work, you've sacrificed, you've like, you've died as hard, you've trained twice a day for eight weeks, you've sacrificed birthday parties, holidays, everything. Just once you get your hand raised, it's all, it's all worth it. And even if you don't get your hand raised, if you know that you've, you've put in, you've done as best as you could, and you've had a good scrap, and you've made a good account of yourself, it's all, it's all worth it. Like. Yeah, and I always ask fighters when they lose, obviously, when you win, there's the high maybe for the day, the day after, then it's straight back to work. What's it like? What was it like when you took your first loss? How did you handle that compared to how you, how you would handle a loss now? At the time, it's, 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 nobody likes losing, but if you can lose and take your lesson from it and get back to the gym and work on why you lost and how you lost and analyse how you lost and use it to become better and then learn not to make the same mistake the next time. That's what it's all about. Yeah. And obviously you, you've passed that on, but you had, you fought the who's who at amateur. I, I was looking through obviously Alexander Sullivan was it with 30 odd fights. You fought so many good, good people. When was it with, with the pro side? When was it decided that it was time to go pro? Was it like, but obviously it'd have to be between you and your coach, but did you just feel at the time that it was, it was ready to go? I just felt like even from, my amateur career, I won Clan Wars title, and then, as I say, I had the kid and stuff, and a, just family obligations and work pulled me away from the sport for a while. So, I wasn't even training anymore, and then my old coach Mickey came to me and said that he was, he had too much work on and he couldn't run the club anymore, and would I take it over? At the time, I thought he was mad, I was like, shit. It was just like imposter syndrome. I didn't think I had the credentials or the experience or would be able to do it. So I went for it and I done it. And then after a couple of months of getting in and training the guys, I just fell back in love with it and had a, made a comeback with my amateur career. I won the Clan Wars belt back. And then I think it was in like a month, I won the Akuma title. And then I was like, fuck it, I want to go pro. Because the way I, I said to you earlier, like with my career, I just see my fighting career as my CV, because coaching is my end goal, and I always, I think I'm going to be around the sport the rest of my life, involved in some way with coaching or coaching or managing fighters or maybe even promoting down the line. Probably running my own promotion would be in the pipeline, maybe. Yeah, and like you said, like that, you're you're. Your, your fighting record is your CV, essentially, and, but you, you're doing a fantastic job there, and that's something that we'll get on to. Um, but when you went into professional, obviously, you went in, your first fight uh, was against Matisse. Um, what was it like after being on such a good run at amateur, coming back like after being out of sport, winning those two best, and then what was it like to lose the first professional fight? I'd say that was a sinking feeling. It wasn't uh, the fairy tale start that you, you think it's going to be like everybody just expects to win their first pro fight and go on from there but it just shows you that it is what it is it's fighting it's anything can happen and plus at, at the time i was my own coach up until i decided to go pro so then i moved to team torres about about 10 weeks before my first pro fight where i probably should have been there a bit longer before i decided to take my first professional fight but it is what it is you learn as you go. And I've been with Team Torres ever since and they've gotten me to where I am now. Yeah, and, and Team Torres uh, is a fantastic club. What was the reason for picking Torres over uh, other gyms? Was it you just like the fighters it's, out there or was it, did you have prior relationships with people? A, it's a very bit of a funny story because on the amateur circuit I competed twice against Team Torres guys on a one, but I feel it was probably the closest fights I've had where their grappling was on a different level. I was come from a striking background, so I was just, my whole style was basically just defend the takedown and stick to my striking. Where those guys put me in situations where I like, I need, I'm not on the same level as these boys grappling, so I would always like to get up and learn what they're learning. So I just decided to, to go there. Yeah, it's, it's a good gym. Obviously you fought, Mickey was one of the, one of the guys that you'd fought on the way up. Um, Ten weeks out obviously doesn't seem like a long time. Obviously, in hindsight, you look back. What kind of if if if, if there was someone joining a club or going over uh, to a club, you'd need what maybe six months or something, or probably even longer to get used to the style of the club, would it? Uh, probably just for me, maybe a bit longer. So I'm a very like introvert person, 
Like it takes me a while to come out of my shell and like from it and new surroundings. But I think maybe just I just I just sort of rushed my first pro fight. So what it. Just wanted to get out there and get... Just wanted to get out there, but it is what it is. And get it done. But obviously you went from there, you went on, I believe it was you went on twos, and then you lost one, and then you came out, and then you fought uh, Breslin. Uh, uh, so you became double champ. Oh, so I had the amateur title and then won the professional title. Oh, you were the first ever person to do that, was it? Uh, or? No, I think Andreas Bender done it too. I think uh, there's been a couple of guys done it. As a... As a so what was it like? Obviously, you lost the first one and then you go on a little bit of a streak. Um, when you started winning, you, did you feel more comfortable then? Because you said you were your own coach, but having someone to guide you, did you feel that was more beneficial, obviously, than, yeah, than being your the, own coach? Yeah, you need a team. You need a, you, need, you need a coach. Amateur, I got away with it for a while. But I knew, like, if I'm going to professional, like, I need to get a, a coach and I need to have a team around me. Yeah, and obviously you need the, the bodies around you. Yeah. They've, they've got so many good bodies in there. So, but when you get to the, the title fight at professional, does that feel any different? Does it feel any better? Does it feel any worse? Do the nerves feel different? Or is it just, is no, fighting just it's fighting? Just fighting, it's just fighting. And every fight's just the next fight. That's all it is. Obviously with the title, it's a bit more of a motivation behind it, but it's just the next fight. And if we're just going to work as hard for every fight, because I think you're only as good as your last fight. And that's, that's one of the funny things about this sport is people tend to forget what you've done up until that point, which is, do you, do you find that quite, I think obviously I'm not a fighter, but I think it's quite unfair. And I think it, it, it could create quite, quite a lonely sort of a feeling as well, that when you're winning, do you have everyone, everyone's in your messages, everyone's in thing, but who's there when the losses come? It's like, just, it's just, you just have to accept it for what it is. Like you could be on a winning streak and you could be like filling buses of people coming to watch you fight and then you get a loss and then the bandwagon drops off a bit and there isn't as many support for the next fight. But once you, if you know who your real fans are and your real supporters are, then it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. It's not like the real ones won't care. Do you know what I mean? And like I said, all the boys here, like you might lose a fight, but look at your favorite fighters. My fighters that I think are my favourites, like they're not all perfect records. They've got losses, they've come back, they've, do you know what I mean? It's just, it's more like the fighting style. If you bring the fight and you put up an entertaining fight, then you're still going to have your fans and your family's still going to love you at the end of the day. Yeah, 100%. And see, like, especially in MMA, no one other than Khabib who walked away at 20, was it 29 or 30? No, you're not going to have a perfect record. And that's what I love about MMA and dislike about boxing because in boxing if you lose one fight you're considered a bum but you feel sometimes that feels like with some of the way people are preparing their careers and stuff like or if, i don't want to say casual fans because i hate that word but when when the fans that aren't the hardcores look in do you think that's starting to creep into mma in a bit a bit now if people lose there's this it's more just people that don't really understand the sport who would like you lose a fight oh he's shite do you know what I mean? It's MMA, there's not many things can happen. Like the same two guys could fight each other 10 times. One of them could win five times, the other guy could win five times. Do you know what I mean? It's just on the day, anything, anything can happen. And it's a sport, there's not many variables in it. That it's, like, that's why it's so hard to bat on MMA too, because there's just so much that can happen. Just fucking tell me about that. <laughs> I think oh, I think my slip last week or for the last one was all all red X's. But sure, look. Um, obviously, you were supposed to fight there. I want to say it was last the end of last, not last year. Last was, June, I was last to June. Fight. So so about a year ago from today, and obviously you you broke your, some part of your foot. Are you looking? Is there a comeback on the horizon? Possibly. I'm back training now, and I think with that time off that I had. I've really got the gym to where it needs to be now, where I can afford to take a wee bit of a step back and maybe focus on getting a fight myself. Like I said, with my fighting career being my CV, I feel like I, I would like to fight on probably some bigger promotions. And Because I know the guys that are coming through here, so at some stage some of them are going to be turning pro. So I want to get out there and make the connections for those guys turning pro, for those guys to follow with the bigger shows. Um, just give everybody opportunities. 
Yeah, and like like that, you've done a fantastic job with the gym. The, I'll, I'll talk about a couple of fighters in a few minutes. Um, but so you're basically you're looking for a comeback. Obviously, Clan Wars have the link with PFL as well. So with you being champion, the, there could be something in the pipeline. Do you have a have a time for when you'd like to get back fighting? I'm just I'm back training now, so obviously it's with a conversation I need to have with my coach. So I'm back training, so I'll have the chat with him and we'll go from there. But Preferably before the end of the year, would like to fight again, yeah. Yeah, and like that, there is the likes of PFL, Bellators, which are actually merged now. You've got Octagon, which are around the UK and Ireland as well. So, um, how, when you first started, obviously, with the gym, and because the gym's gone so well, how hard was that to balance, like, your own kind I know you got injured, but, like, how did you manage to balance your own kind of fighting career, the gym, and then, like I said, family life, kids, stuff like that? Like It was always a struggle for me, trying to find the balance between coaching and competing it always it always was but from last year where i had that time off injured i've just been solely committed on, on the coaching and i think i've got a i think i've got around 10 amateur amateur active fighters there and the gym's going well but I've, it's got to the stage now where i have guys that are cap well capable to jump in and take a class while i'm away somewhere if i have to go train somewhere else it's we're all working together and we're all running the place the way it should now where before i was I was a striking coach, I was a wrestling coach, I was a BJJ coach, I was taking the kids' classes, I was taking boxing classes, and then I was trying to fit in my own training there too, where now I have guys like allocated to certain jobs, do you know what I mean? Even cleaning, like the cleaning this place twice a day was time consuming. I have yeah. a guy that comes in and cleans for me now, so everybody's just helping out, and it's very well organised now, and it's a credit to all the boys I have around me in the gym. Yeah, it isn't like that. Obviously, when you start something new, there's always going to be teething issues, but you seem to, that with time and experience, that's what you've got figured out. And you said there's a, there's, you've a couple of active fighters. Obviously, Jamie was, was here earlier. Uh, there's your brother, uh, Kelsey Crossy, I was quite impressed with. Do you get, like, explain to me what this is, because I spoke to a coach before who competed or was still competing, and he said he got more satisfaction now of seeing those people grow than his own fights, which I found kind quite strange because it's kind of a selfless thing whereas i think mma is a self you have to be selfish in it what's the kind of feeling like when you see the likes of jamie who just became the chaos champion your brother went out and had an absolute banger at your fighting championship and then uh, kelsey crossy as well who looked very good it is i love to see it because a lot of the times these guys coming in here they just remind me of me and i say like they could well and truly be doing a lot worse things than being in here training do you know what i mean especially with the town gets a bit of a bad rap sometimes, but there is good people in the town and there's people that want to do well and want to see people do well. And if I can help somebody change their life for the better, and maybe there's not, like, I didn't have any qualifications or anything when I left school and I've managed to make myself a career out of this. And I think MMA and I, it's, it's an industry on its own. Like, you can get involved coaching, you can fight, you can ref, you can judge, you can be on a cut team. You can be part of the media. It's just, there's lots of different avenues you can go there. So if I get somebody interested in it and they, they like it and they make something of themselves out of it, then it's a win, isn't it? Yeah, and then obviously you're, you're taking from your past experience and, and seeing potentially people going down the wrong road. I mean, so is that like, is that you giving back to MMA, what MMA has given to you uh, to, to change a lifestyle and change life. So, so like I love the coach. The coaching is my end goal. That's why I'm always going to be around the sport, coaching in some way, shape, or form. So, I just enjoy fighting too, and I'm going to try and make the most out of my career while I can. I'm, I'm healthy and I'm fit, so why not? I'll only regret it in the years to come if I don't stretch it out as long as I can. But I've a few fights left, and I'll be going full time into coaching after that. You know, and I can't, I can't wait to see you come back and fight and where it may be and who may it be against. But, like, you've done so well, like, changing uh, everything around. Obviously, you said when you had your child, that was kind of the main factor as well. Um, and then to get to here, when you look back, like, on your life, back to that point to now, can you even, like... It's mad. Sometimes I just have to stop and think to myself, like, fuck, I could have been in a whole lot worse of a situation here than what I am now. And I'm grateful every day for the opportunity that I got and the life that I live now. 
And one thing I've seen you posted before is someone that said to you, MMA won't pay the bills. Oh, this was uh, a guy that I used to hang about with. We were at the gym one day just lifting weights and I was telling him what I was going to do and he was like, you're mad, MMA is not going to pay the bills, but I've made a way to, to make it work. And how does it feel like to have your passion as kind of your work and that's how you get money? Uh, like you said, changing these people's lives, bringing them on to be fighters. Like I said, Jamie just won a title. He's looking, he's looking like he's going to be a hot prospect in the near future. Um, and then, like, how does it feel to, to be able to, to live your life the way you do with MMA and pay the bills with it? Because a lot of people said, like, if you, don't, if you love what you're doing, you don't work a day in your life. Does it feel like that? It's still work. But I love it. Do you know what I mean? I've had a lot of jobs that I didn't like and I never really found myself. I could never... I never really got on well in the normal work, work environment. So to be my own boss and pick my own hours and do what I love, it's just, I'm just grateful to be able to do it. Yeah, no, and it, it is, like I said, when you love something, it is work, but it doesn't feel as... No. It's, it's not like going to an office it's, from nine yeah, to five. it's not like nine to five, Monday to Friday, and then just make the most of your weekend and dread going in on the Monday. I, I'm here seven days a week, I love it. Well, that's, that's the main thing, isn't it? And then, like that, how long have you actually been at the helm of this gym? Because like I said, you've got about 10 active fighters. Um, and it was, I want to say, was it one or two shows that you actually, you had a clean sweep on? It was on your fighting championship your, at Case? It was about three weeks ago. Yeah. It's, I've been head coach here for about maybe five, probably six years now. And plus, at the, at the time, I was more focused on my own career, to be honest. So I would have had the odd fight here and there of somebody coming through the club, or was nobody really made like a, a run at anything or a career. It was just like sort of one-off fights here and there. But I think the time off that I had, and just focus on the fighters that I had and bring everyone on, were going well now as an active fight team. Yeah, it is. And, and obviously, Kieran Brady was one who yeah. I actually forgot. When you see Kieran Brady and fighting on Cage Warriors for his debut, and the fact that he came from this gym, like, this is where, you, like, how does that make you feel as a coach and as a person? I probably, Kieran? at the start of Kieran's career, probably motivated him in some way, shape, or form. Now he motivates me. That man is a workhorse, like, and he's got a bright future ahead of himself. So he does. No, he does, and like that, I was, it was a good night watching him. He puts himself in these dangerous positions to, to put his opponent in danger, but it, it's nerve-wracking to watch. But uh, when your career, whether it be a fighter or coaching, when people look back on uh, your career as a coach or as a fighter and they think of your name, what words or what sentence or what phrase would you want to associate? How do you want to be remembered? If somebody just remembers me as the guy that got them started and made a positive impact on their life. That's all I'm in it for, to be honest. No, and that kind of roots back to when someone was kind of positive to you and yeah. kind of set you on this on, like the martial arts side of it, I think it's all about like your lineage. So like if I'm part of somebody's lineage and they go on and then they have their own lineage where I can like trace my lineage back to my coach and his coach. If I'm somewhere along someone else's lineage, it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah, like when you look back at the black belts who yeah. got their black belt off who, and obviously Kieran through your lineage, he actually has set up his own thing now yeah, as well. Yeah, so. yeah, he has his own gym now, so he does. So it's it's, so it's, 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 it's I just want to keep this thing going as long as I can, like I've carried it on down through the generations. Yeah, no, and you're doing a fantastic job, like I said, with your fight career. Hopefully, we see you back, and then with the gym as well. So thank you very Good much. Man, Dave. Thank, thank you. you.